and welcome to a new video and not only a new video but also a new video with new equipment I am recording this on a uh, good quality panoramic USB webcam and a brand new uh, microphone which my wife gave me for Christmas isn't that wonderful uh, so hopefully this will improve not only the quality of the video, but also the quality of uh, the sound as well. Um, I've been asked to talk about the whole business of teaching at a distance. Uh, one of the big issues that has come upon us uh, because of the nature of the current emergency with the COVID-19 virus <coughs> covering the globe, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic, and dare I, dare I need to say this, but hey, uh, maybe future, future years when we look back on this particular event, we'll end up having to explain exactly why this has become an issue. But yes, we have a pandemic, we have a dangerous virus around, and I'm recording this in January of 2021 at a point where COVID-19's new variant has caused us to be locked down in, in, in the UK yet again. I thought we'd had enough of this uh, last spring, but we're back to square one again. So this is causing immense difficulties for people working in education. We have pressure on us from both sides of the fence. On the one hand, we have a professional responsibility to our students, to children, young people and adults irrespective of whether we're working within the uh, school sector, the state sector, or whether, whether we're working in the post-compulsory education aspect of education in the UK, it is uh, still the same professional responsibility to do the best we can for our uh, charges of whatever age they may be. But on the other hand, we have the issue of trying to stay safe stay healthy and not spread the virus around. So we're caught between two traps. We need to continue to do the edu job we're supposed to as, as educationalists, but we're also supposed to be aware of the fact that we can't have the kind of social contact that we would normally have. Schools are closed, colleges are closed, Centres of education are closed. Universities are having a hell of a time of it. We're all trying to do our very best by substituting what I can only describe as an ersatz version of the communication systems that we're used to in terms of education uh, if on a face-to-face -face basis. Yes, I know it sounds a bit harsh, but this is a poor substitute for the real, real? <laughs> The, 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 the business of being in a classroom with a group, uh, whether they be children or adults, same problem applies. What is missing here is the social contact aspect, which, of course, is central to the whole business of teaching and learning. This is a cru the word crucial doesn't overemphasize it enough. It is a very important aspect of the way in which learning works that people have some sort of social context in which their learning can develop, irrespective of what age they may be. If you're very young, though, if you're starting off in life and going to school, then one of the most important aspects of being at school is to be with your friends, be in the social groupings when you're learning, and to relate to a, to a, to a teacher on a face-to-face -face basis in such a way as to provide those sorts of non-didactic aspects of learning which are so important to a child's development. In other words, that a child gets to know what it's like to be in a non-family related social atmosphere, that it gets to know what its place it can be within a social grouping, that it gets to know its relationships both to other adults who are not relatives and also to children who are not part of their same immediate, immediate uh, family or, or as we call them these days they're our bubble uh, <laughs> yeah so this is a, a problematic thing that's not happening 
Yeah, um, we, we, the best we can do at the moment is to interpose technological uh, aspects of teaching, which at the end try to substitute for those sorts of aspects. Now, like, can I make it clear? One of the big, big mythologies that we have here with regards to teaching and learning, uh, irrespective of the age groups we're, con we're concerned with, is that learning will happen whether or not education functions. Education is directed learning within a framework which is useful, if that's the right word, useful or part of the social aims of any particular culture or society. So an educational system in a school, a college, a university is part and parcel of society's vision of what learning should be. In other words, what we are supposed to be learning, which is requirements of the society in which we live, what, what aspects of learning, what kind of learning we are supposed to be involved in, involved in is part of that framework of education. And that's why education is in fact so, such a hot issue. It's a hot topic because it involves an awful lot of political pressure, uh, issues of culture and background and context and history and so on, which form a major basis of the way in which uh, <clears throat> education functions. And it's in that, in that battleground of context that we find ourselves talking about the direction learning should take, and so on and so forth. But let it be clearly said, children, particularly children, particularly children, but also adults, will continue to learn, irrespective of the fact whether education exists or not. I mean, this is pretty obvious. You know, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the millennia before there was such a thing as formal education within civilization as we know it, <coughs> People learned. They learned in their own small groupings, in their own villages, their own small towns, on their homesteads, in their families, in their tribal groups, whatever they happen to be. They learned that way anyway. We are in a different kind of situation now. We're in a different kind of set of pressures, as I have outlined previously. And consequently, the, it's easy to lose focus of this fact that learning as, as an organic issue will happen irrespective of what you or I or anybody else does. So the question always is, what is it that's being learned? Not just, is learning happening? Clearly, we would like to see students, as children or as, or as adults, succeed in their aims, which will gain them some purchase on the activities that you know, they, they have in mind for their, for, for their lives, irrespective of whether that be related to work or to their personal and social development. But below all that, there is this issue of taking that natural capacity that, that individuals have got to learn in a social framework and, and, and increasing that capacity to the, to the extent that when a crisis like this happens, we find ourselves in a situation where the uh, individuals have still got the relevant skills necessary to continue to work in circumstances which are quite unusual. So let me put it Put it, put it simply, I think, I think the crucial factor right now is not so much is learning happening, but that it has been fostered in such a way as that it enables children and adults to continue to gain the necessary meta skills of learning. That's to say, learning how to learn, to continue to be able to learn in their own way, in their own time, in their own environment, whatever it happens to be, whether, that, whether that's most likely these days likely to be at, at home. We cannot just throw this onto schools and say, look, you should be open or you should be doing this or you should be doing that. We cannot just simply throw it onto, onto the laps of parents or caregivers because at the end of the day, then, you know, this is a, an aspect of, of, of uh, um, the parents' life that I suppose at the end of the day, they weren't bargaining and coming around the corner at them. They will help a child to learn, and yes, because most, most parents want their children to be apt learners, to be quick learners. But there needs to be some sort of like framework around, around which both learning a distance from the point, from the point of view of professionals working out at schools and, 
and post-compulsory system, and also parents can operate together in order to support children who happen, and adults who happen to be at home at the moment. So how is that done? Well, there are ways of, of promoting better chances for these learning-to-learn -learn skills to operate, and it's these I want to outline right now. First of all, learning is, learning is an organic and natural aspect of human life is couched in the business of communication. It always has been, always has been. The media of learning is communication. Therefore, in a situation in which we find ourselves at a distance from one another, one of the most crucial aspects of, of trying to continue that kind of aspect of organic development is to have as many possible redundant channels of, channels of communication as we can manage. Now, what do I mean by redundant? I mean that information comes to an individual from a variety of different sources and is assimilated through a variety of different methods. It's the same information, but coming from a variety of different points of view. This is, this is what I mean by redundancy. In a in a face-to-face -face environment, this kind of redundancy would take place, for instance, in things such as explaining something verbally, having people get involved in an activity in which they make use of a particular experience, which is another form of communication, or writing it down on a, on a, on a whiteboard, or getting to people to read about it, or getting to people to just watch a video about it. These are multiple channels of communication. Verbal, written, proxemical, which I, well, by that I mean to say operating in relationships with one another in activity. Social, uh, oral, da, 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 da. In fact, one of the most important things you may have gathered from all this is to stimulate the senses as much as is possible using channels of communication. This is what happens in all the best schools anyway. It happens in the best universities, happens in the best colleges. People get to experience learning situations which stimulate the senses. So, stands to reason then, if you're going to be teaching at a distance, then you have to do exactly the same thing. The, the challenge doesn't change. Stimulating the senses on by using multiple different uh, redundant channels of communication matters a great deal. So, how would one do that? Well, for, let's take, for instance, the, the, the audio-visual side of these things. This is the most common one of a lot and the one most of us are probably aware of. Helping a student to gain, uh, to gain access to online resources that are video-related. Video-related material, for instance, could be in the form of the very video you're listening to like right now, in a sense, homemade materials. And I think, you know, uh, the idea of teachers sitting down and making videos like this is actually a very good idea. You know, it's the idea you can get to talk to your students for at a maximum about 20 minutes, uh, because that's more, longer than 20 minutes that the, the attention level tends, to, tends to, to, to drop fairly radically. It gives the, that first aspect of a, uh, a, a, a stimulus to the to the, to the senses, in this particular case, the oral and visual side of things. Now, if you're more skilled with video than I am, you would, of course, not just have a talking head <laughs> like this one. What you would have is a very, very varied video of the, you can see some very skilled examples, for instance, on YouTube. Uh, and I think, you know, there are, there are, you know, there are, there are uh, video creation resources in the outside world which you can gain, get hold of, which will enable you to edit video, restructure video, you know, create videos from the, from the ground upwards, that, which will mean that you can actually, on a laptop, on a simple laptop, you can have your very own editing studio. Now, I've had to learn to do this over the past nine months in the time that uh, the pandemic has been in place. So it's not surprising to discover, for instance, that, that um, it's been a kind of fairly steep learning curve. And I'm still learning. I'm still learning. Nevertheless, it has got better as time has gone on. And I think this is one of the, the most important aspects of, of, of 
of this process. It is actually not a, just a challenge for me, but it's also been a really interesting thing that I've been able to learn as, a, as an, an extra string to my bow that I've learned to use video editing software. I've learned to use how to use a microphone and a camera. I have learned how to connect these to a laptop. Now, there are many, many uh, uh, tutorials about using cameras, using Microsoft Windows, Mac, uh, Mac OS, uh, Linux, etc., etc., in the outside world. So please do go and have a look at look for those. Another thing to remember is you don't have to buy expensive software. For instance, I do an awful lot of my edit, video editing using a, a an open source program called called KDE and Live, uh, which is very good and it, it's a highly sophisticated piece of kit. It doesn't cost me anything at all, uh, uh, so it, it's quite possible that you can also record video and even stream video using a piece of software called OBS Studio. Uh, so if you dig that out, you'll find it's, it's a really useful piece of kit and you can use that on any system. Okay, so stimulating the, the, the visual and uh, audio senses is actually one way of doing that. But, you know, to be perfectly honest with you, it's not always the best way to do things because not everybody is, is going to sit and watch videos every day. That's pretty much clear. And kids particularly get bored after a short while. So what else can you do? Well, another aspect of that is through the business of discussion. Discussion is a way of encouraging uh, verbal skills. It's a, it's a way of encouraging re re reasoning skills. And it can be done online, you know, via uh, systems such as Zoom getting a bunch of people together to sit down to talk through a particular issue. Using case studies, in particular, is a really good way of engaging them in the business of chucking ideas around, uh, making sense of the world as it is, and also not just learning from the teacher, the talking head teacher, which is the kind of way, the traditional didactic way of working, but also that through the business of learning from each other and using this Socratic method of, of of teaching. So, if you, for instance, are working with a group on Zoom, one of the most important aspects of doing that this is to use questioning as a process of stimulating discussion to get uh, children and adults together by asking them questions about a particular topic and then setting them off in the business of exchanges with each other and with you as, as the need occurs. If a discussion is going along pretty happily and it's still focused on the topic which you set, then it doesn't really need much intervention from the teacher, provided at the end of the day that it's not dying a death. And in which case, if it is, you simply ask yet another question about the topic. And hopefully that will continue to stimulate ideas. It needs to be done in a very subtle and informal way, forcibly kind of doing this. It doesn't quite work. You need to do this almost conversationally in such a way that it's, it becomes second nature. Once you've engaged in a conversation with somebody, I do it quite a lot when I'm teaching philosophy, I'll, I will ask a kind of almost offhand question. You know, things, if we're dealing with ethics, I'll, I'll say things like, do you, what's this word morality? What is, what is, what is, what is morality? Anybody got any idea what morality is? It's, slightly confused, those sorts of things. Or, or, is, it, is it ever right to be self-centered? The idea being that these sorts of questions get people talking. And in the process of doing that, that kind of engagement it becomes more stimulated than simply just listening to things like video. So what we're doing here is engaging the verbal aspects of individuals. But there's a secondary aspect of, 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 of engaging in, the, in verbal aspects, and that's the business of reading. Reading is really good, and, and uh, what I suggest is that the, the, the things to get people, especially kids reading, is not, not textbooks, funny enough, but appropriate fiction. Appropriate fiction can be almost anything. Um, I'll give you an example of what I mean. Um, supposing you were wanting to teach uh, children about uh, history, and you wanted them to know a little bit more about the Roman Empire, for instance. Well, there are lots of good you know, child-centered novels about, about 
Roman history, which is to do with Roman centurions on on, the, on Hadrian's Wall and and the lives of people in in, in Britannic and in, in, in uh, Anglo um, Anglo Roman Britain and so on and so forth. One of my favourite novels. It's really for adults, but I suppose youngsters could read it. You know, teenagers could read it. Is a novel called uh, Eagle in the, Eagle in the Snow by Wallace Bream, and it's all about the the fall of the Roman Empire and the last stand of a Roman legion on the Rhine in Germany uh, and about this, this character, this Roman general called Maximus, yes, same name as the one in Gladiator, uh, and, his, and his stand against these, these huge hordes of tribesmen waiting across the river, waiting for the, for the river to be crossable. Uh, and what, what's interesting about learning about uh, reading about reading this novel is you learn enormous amounts about organization of Roman of the Roman military, about the way in which uh, Roman discipline, the discipline in the Roman army was up, well, operated, about a little bits about Latin and about place names and so on and so forth. So it's a really useful source of information on top of the business. It's a cracking good story, as the state as the saying goes. So on top of the business of these sorts of talking head videos, and the top of the business of getting together on the, with Zoom to do discussion, there is also the business of encouraging individuals to read stuff which is entertaining and fun, you know? Uh, and I think those sorts of aspects of, of learning are often forgotten. There is a, sense, there is a tendency for us to, to think in terms that, that if, it's, if it's fun, it must not be particularly good at <laughs> in terms of as a learning resource. I think the opposite. I think if it's boring, people are going to avoid it. And consequently, I think the most important aspect of the whole business of being a, a teacher is to provide resources which people will love using. Entertaining stuff. Some of the textbooks I've seen have been terribly tedious. So please get something which is of stimulation, stimulating for the individual, and gives them a strong sense of interest. When I was growing up, I loved science fiction. So consequently, as I became an adult, and later on in my life, I've always retained an interest in science, full stop. And I don't find science challenging. Not, it's not because I'm naturally you know, inclined towards science. It's because at the end of the day, I grew up with it as an entertaining fiction, and therefore don't find it frightening. And so things like peripheral aspects of that, like, like technology, like computers, for me are never are never really a, a, a scary thing to, to be involved in. So we've, we've, we're stimulating the, the, the audio-visual aspect of that. We're, we're stimulating discursive, the verbal aspects of all of that. We're, we're helping children become more literate through encouraging more reading, and I think that's good for adults too. We also, at the end of the day, need to get people to exchange with one another by being part of groups in which communication isn't just verbal, isn't just on video, but also can be done via text too. This is good for things like literacy. So, I strongly believe in things like email lists, chat systems, and so on and so forth. These are freely available on the internet. They can be set up in such a way as they're constantly monitored to make sure they don't become, uh, you know, a, a threat to individuals in which there is a, you know, where the safeguarding element is, is maintained strongly. And I think one of the most important aspects of all of that is it means that individuals can chat to each other under the aegis of a, of a teacher and a parent. And I think both should be working together on this. You know, the engagement between schools and parents needs to be very tight here. There needs to be that kind of engagement. Um, and I think those sorts of aspects of it, being able to send messages back and forth to ask for help about particular tasks that, that children may be doing or adults may be doing, and also looking at the whole business of just being able to engage with one another outside the business of audiovisually through, through, through things like Zoom, da, 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 da. And I think those multiple redundant, multiple redundant, Channels of communication help with the business of, of the way in which individuals 
can communicate. And also it means that they, they, can, they can emphasize certain aspects of communication. Some, some people don't do too well on um, audiovisual systems, for instance. Don't like them at all because of the fact that sitting in front of a camera, you have to have a certain degree of, you know, of, of, of self-confidence, I suppose, to, to, to be able to sit in front of a camera and, and then be willing to be seen by other people. I'm not sure why, but it's certainly the case that people have, have camera phobia on occasions. And I'm sure that's the case with children as much as it is with, with adults. And some people just don't have a facility. Therefore, there needs to be a redundant fallback position for those who do not have that technology through the business of um, text, if possible, or, vis or, or, or audio snippets, recording snippets of audio, and then emailing them off to individuals. And it's a slower system, but it does work. And you can, do, you can record audio on a mobile phone and then message it off to someone else. So there are these various approaches which can be used together in one system. Lastly, and I think this is one of the most important aspects of the lot, is repositories of resources. By repositories of resources, I mean not just centralized systems at schools and universities where people can log in and get access to the library and so on and so forth, but also that each teacher should have their own individual repository of documents, audiovisual system, audiovisual uh, um, creations, uh, links to useful websites, and so on and so forth. One way I gather and accumulate and promote these resources is through a website called Padlet. P-A-D-L-E-T. -E Padlet is really very good because you can sign up with it for nothing. It gives you the opportunity then to have a screen where you can pin a, 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 a document or a link to a website or a, a sound file or a video file or whatever it is. And they come up as little thumbnails which show you a, a brief image of what it is you're looking at. So this is much more fun to use than it would be if you were just using a, you know, a, a list of items on a, on a sheet of paper or a, on a PDF file or something like that. You know, it, 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 you know a, a website URLs are not really interesting. But little thumbnails on a tablet is really very good. And people find it really attractive to be able to scroll through these things and find things they might be interested in using. And if it's an individual teacher's resource, then it means their students can feel that they're getting one-to-one -one bespoke support instead of just the generic kind of thing that institutions do. Institutions are really good at having broad approaches to things. They're very good at the business of creating um, you know, re uh, resource bases which are suitable for everybody which are kind of like the very generic stuff. But teachers know their own students. Therefore, teachers need their own unique repositories of information, their own Padlet page, perhaps, or pages in which they can, they, they can, they can uh, uh, keep materials for their, for their groups. And, and, and also keep their students informed via maybe an email list or something of the sort about what is on that particular list. So when something new comes up, you, you immediately email everybody, oh, look, I've just created this. Go and have a look at this. This is really interesting. And keep adding to it every so often. So every week, new things are added to the Padlet. So what you get here is a broad-based approach, a base of pr princi the principle of creating an environment inside. Thank you very much. Technology. Uh, the broad-based approach into which uh, teaching happens, teaching and learning happens. This broad basic approach creates an environment for learning, which at the end, the individuals who are taking part feel that they're part of something that's not just a pipeline from the teacher to them, but which they are actually physically engaged in at multiple different levels, and which they can feel that they take that engagement in a way that suits their previous knowledge, their their, their capacity to learn 
their ability to take on board information, the resources they have at home, and so on and so forth. Now, this is not a perfect system. You may well have listened to what I've had to say so far and thought to yourself, I know, but it's all right you saying this, B. I just don't have the skills. Or, it's all right you saying this, B. I just don't have the time. Or, it's all right you saying this sort of stuff, B. But my students wouldn't take to that. And the answer is, we're going to have to learn, we're going to have to change, and we're going to have to be adaptive, and we're going to have to engage far more directly with families, with not just the learner themselves, but the environment in which they live. We're going to have to change in the sense our skill sets are going to have to expand. So on top of the business of what you're already studying and teaching, you're going to have to do this. And that, it's an unfortunate state of affairs, but it, it, the, 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 this, the future is not going to change in the sense that we're, we're, we're not going to go back to do the normal state of affairs we had pre-pandemic. There is always going to be a need in the post-pandemic era for uh, this blended learning approach, as it's often referred to. I don't really like that phrase. I think probably it gives, it gives a kind of a vagueness to it. What I wanted to do is to explain this multiple redundancy approach. The other aspect of all this, yes, I know the workload is high, but the great thing about the investment in, in, in terms of skills at this stage is that the workload though does decrease because of the way in which you change the way you work. It will get easier as time goes on because what will happen is you will accumulate resources which can be used over and over and over and over and over and over again, which you didn't have before. The kind of resources you may have had in classrooms, workshops, university lecture theatres may or may not be useful to transfer into the new world in which we're living at the moment. But the ones you create from now on will be incredibly useful, irrespective of whether we end up back in classrooms and, and, and lecture theatres ever again. It may well be that we end up back in classrooms, but at the end of the day, we will still also have these resources as a backup and a support, and to expand the nature of the engagement with students outside the business of just what we do in schools just what we do in universities, just what we do in further education colleges. I think that's about it. I'm, I'm not going to harangue you anymore. I think I'll finish there. I hope you found this useful. Um, I'll try as best I can to start accumulating a list of possible resources. Um, uh, the best way to make sure that I do this is to nag me about it. So if you happen to, to know me, please do keep saying to me, B, have you got a list of useful resources to use in, in distance, le distance learning under the present uh, exigencies? And drop me a line every so often. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. And um, stay safe. Bye-bye for now. <laughs>